Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this seminar series organized by the Empathic Computing Laboratory. Uh, I'm your host, Aladdin, and our guest speaker for today is uh, Dr. Rofi Du, who is a senior research scientist at Google and works on creating novel interactive technologies for virtual and augmented reality. His research interests include AR, VR, interactive graphics, his work was published and recognized by many international conferences and venues. And in this seminar, uh, he will be sharing his research on interactive perception and graphics technology that empowers the metaverse with more universal accessibility. The title of the talk is Interactive Perception and Graphics uh, for Universally Accessible Metaverse. The talk will be roughly an hour, uh, followed by brief question and answers. I'm sure we are looking, we are all looking forward to hearing his thoughts on and ideas on this topic. Please join me to welcome Dr. Du. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nasani, for inviting me to give the guest talk, and thank you for the great introduction. And uh, first of all, uh, I'm really honored to share some of, some of my latest research in virtual and augmented reality at the ECL seminar series. And uh, thanks, Dr. Nasani, for inviting me. The title of my talk today is Interactive Graphics for a Universally Accessible Metaverse. Uh, before we start it, I would like to give a brief visual summary of my research. I'm currently a senior research scientist at Google Labs. And uh, you can also find my latest research in Google Scholar. Uh, my research mainly lies in the intersection of three fields, computer graphics, human-computer interaction, and computer vision, um, where I perform cross-field research by taking the latest computer graphics techniques, computer vision techniques into interactive systems and creative applications in virtual and augmented reality. The agenda of the talk today is focused on a few of the key papers in HCI uh, in about one hour. Uh, by topics, my research mainly focuses on three parts, interaction and communication, digital world, and digital human. Next, let's dive deep into the main part of my talk, interactive graphics for universally accessible metaverse. Uh, you may be curious, what is metaverse? <laughs> and how metaverse is defined by academia and the industry? The concept of metaverse dates back to science fiction novel, Snow Crash, uh, written by Neil Stephenson in 1992. And in this novel, metaverse is an immersive virtual urban environment where people can trace virtual lines and build houses in this metaverse. And the users in metaverse can either enter the environment uh, with virtual reality glasses uh, and interact with other people virtually uh, and remotely. A closer concept uh, is the origin environment in the recent movie Ready Player One, uh, which is closer uh, to a world-scale MMORPG game. But uh, is this all what Metaverse is about? Uh, not really. In industry, there are roughly like two kinds of companies devoting to Metaverse. Uh, one is like a gaming platform such as Roblox, which devotes to a platform where players can create things in a virtual environment and trade virtual currency directly. And right now there are over 200 million players per month. Uh, the other kind of network is like um, Microsoft and Facebook and Meta uh, who devote to developing AR devices and services. And from my personal experience, experiences, uh, the word metaverse is actually an idealized concept uh, that encapsulates many buzzwords, for example, uh, the future of internet, uh, the internet of things in 5G, uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, and even blockchain plus NFT, uh, mirrored world, uh, digital twin, uh, and the virtual reality OS. So despite of these buzzwords, so uh, from researcher perspective, how do I define metaverse? And more importantly, what research directions shall we devote to metaverse? Uh, my personal perspective, Metaverse, uh, I want it to be envisioned uh, as a persistent digital world where people are fully connected as, as virtual representations. 
Uh, as a teenager, my dream was actually to live in the metaverse. However, as of today, uh, I no longer have such dream, but I personally wish metaverse is only a tool to make information more useful and accessible and help people, people to live a better physical life. So next, I would like to dive deep into several works I have devoting to metaverse. And chapter one, uh, mirrored world and the real-time rendering, uh, starting with social street view and the jewelry. Oh, so this is some old stuff. And uh, speaking of social media, uh, it social media covers a wide range of topics such as restaurant reviews, local news, and updates from families and friends. But despite of the recent innovation in virtual reality and augmented reality, the current generation of social media layout is still most realized as a linear narrative and rarely in a 2D layout and almost never in a 3D immersive mixed reality settings. While the traditional layouts are efficient on phones for quickly browsing through social media posts, they lack the spatial context associated with the social media. So in 2016, so I presented the social digital system in Web3D 2016 and made some initial contribution in blending immersive street views with geotech social media using maximal Poisson disk sampling. So basically the idea is to take the depth map from the Google street view and try to depict uh, the social media nearby onto the building walls uh, using uh, maximal Poisson disk sampling so that they are uh, as a beautifully laid, laid out on the, on the building walls. However, the interaction here was still limited to 360 degree panoramas where users could hardly virtually walk on the streets but only teleport from one panorama to another panorama. And following that work uh, in 2017, uh, within 3D visual popularity uh, where researchers are using virtual lights to uh, indicate the popularity of social media with virtual 3D buildings. And in CSW 2017, uh, Kuka uh, et al. proposed the virtual Aulu, which basically reconstructs uh, virtual buildings and let avatars to walk on virtual streets with uh, social media depicted along the streets. And in this 2018, uh, Brescia's team uh, made the virtual trip reports where they can depict uh, their captured uh, hiking pictures onto 3D terrains and uh, make it immersively uh, explored in the virtual environments. And in recent years, we have seen high fidelity and uh, Facebook spaces uh, where avatars can talk with each other. But still, I would like to imagine like what may a social media platform look like in virtual reality? And what if we could allow social media sharing in a live mirrored world? And what use cases can we benefit by depicting social media in virtual reality? So uh, in 2019, uh, we published the Geology System, which is one of the first mixed reality social media platform that uh, encapsulates avatars, uh, chatting system, and more importantly, the nearby social media from Twitter, Yelp, and Instagram. And so that, for example, here you are visiting the National Gallery uh, in Washington, DC, and you can just uh, draw the street drawings directly on the walls of the buildings and you chat with another avatars. And uh, you can also imagine the future when you can uh, walk into the museum and talk with other virtual avatars and uh, look at the virtual uh, paintings directly in the building walls. That will be uh, the envisioned world. So to, to achieve that, so we built a technical system which basically uh, gets information from 2D polygons from open system. And uh, further, we get the buildings by extruding the 2D polygons into 3D geometry. And next, we added avatars, clouds, trees, based on the metadata we achieved from OpenStreetMaps. And meanwhile, uh, we can achieve uh, the nearby geotech social media from Twitter, Yelp, Flickr, using their open access APIs. And we also maintain our own database and library to uh, contain like different forms of social media, for example, balloons, billboards, and GIFs. And finally, we, we enabled the avatars to directly talk with each other in this uh, mixed reality social media platform. 
And next, uh, I would like to dive deep into the rendering pipeline, like how we achieve the rendering uh, of the social media. Before we do that, I can actually give you a live uh, demo. So right now, I think I'm teleported into uh, Auckland Hospital Support. Uh, I don't know where I am in the, it is a correct building. I'm visualizing in the University of Auckland. Yeah, very close. Very close. Okay, so uh, which uh, building should I search? Like bioengineering building? Oh, uh, let me see. Auckland University of Auckland. Uh, yeah, there are library. Yeah, you can basically teleport to a library and uh, let me see if, oh, okay, here, here I am. So basically you see like how the library is extruded and you can directly visit it. And uh, meanwhile, you can just uh, publish something new. Let me see, hello, <laughs> and uh, publish. Okay, here we go. And uh, if you come to the same place with me, you can chat with me with hi, and uh, let's come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I love to do live demo for every talk I have been with. And uh, you can see like how the system is still running live. You can visit my website for the live demo. So basically, as you see, we got the uh, 2D polygons, uh, 3D geometry by extruding them, uh, especially in New York City or San Francisco, uh, the Google Street, the open street map uh, contains metadata like how high a building is or how many floors a building is. So we use the heuristics and uh, actual building heights to depict the different buildings in real time. And next, you have avatars in the, in the system and you can walk around. And finally, we fetch the street view panoramas, depth map, uh, normal map, and so that we uh, go dive into the pipeline. So uh, naively, like uh, if you have only one panorama, it still gives you the illusion like you are uh, teleporting from one panorama to the next panorama. So to reduce the visual jitter and the visual artifacts, uh, we first uh, depict two panoramas and uh, and also alter, we adjust the vertex of the each triangle on the hemisphere so that the, uh, like the XYZ corresponds to the true depth value according to the two depth maps. And finally, uh, we figure out the intersected uh, regions in real time and also we get rid of the triangles which are intersected and uh, uh, encapsulated in the hemisphere. And finally, we do projection mapping to uh, project the texture onto the two hemispheres. And uh, we do a little bit uh, alpha blending. And uh, this is how you are seeing the uh, University of Auckland uh, renders in real time. Uh, there are still some artifacts, as you see, we don't have depth data on the top but uh, you can already like walk around and see the library in real time. And you can even like uh, uh, draw something uh, on the building walls. Let me see if it's still working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you zoom out, uh, you can, yeah, there are some bugs on this building walls like uh, aliasing artifacts, but uh, here you can see my drawings and uh, directly on the building walls here. <laughs> And uh, yes, the system is still working on online. You can log in with your Google account. So finally, we did a user study and trying to explore the use case and how the user are actually using the two systems, Social Street View and the Geology. So we used a qualitative, a quantitative evaluation questionnaires and also post hoc interviews. And we find that by adding the ability to actually walk in the mirrored world, uh, the users find the ge new jewelry system more interactive and more creative. For example, people propose use cases, for example, to see all the restaurants with street views. Uh, it's really helpful. And also, it is useful to explore new places. For example, I could immerse myself into the location and also ask questions if there are like virtual students walking the campus. And uh, people also think it may be useful to, for families. For example, I just taught my grandpa how to use FaceTime. And it would be awesome if I could teleport to my grandpa's house and uh, greet with them virtually in virtual reality. And uh, more importantly, like uh, the photorealistic buildings are really critical to the system. So we also explored uh, other rendering pipelines. For example, really reconstruct a campus building into the maps so that we can combine the photorealistic building together with the maps. 
However, this is also future work, and uh, we haven't gone that far. And we demonstrate in CHI 2019 uh, on site uh, with one undergraduate I supervised by the time. And uh, since then, uh, I've seen follow up work. For example, people are bringing semantic data into the pipeline so that you can better reconstruct everything. For example, here you see the green trees and the pur purple grounds. So by adding semantic uh, implementation, you can make the pipeline more efficient. Uh, but still, uh, you also see people are bringing whiteboards and uh, have a real 3D museum with avatars. And I truly believe like this kind of research can lead into a, a real-time system which combines mirrored walls and the information around us and make it more useful. And uh, uh, the other uh, idea I had here is like, uh, we have so many surveillance video cameras uh, in campus. So what if we can reproject these surveillance videos into the 3D maps so that you can immersively see what is currently happening in the campus and uh, it is more effective and efficient for the civilians camera administrators to look at the 3D video rather than the 2D grid-like surveillance video. So this is another exploration. Uh, another exploration we did is uh, we tried to use neural network to uh, animate the morphing between one panorama to another panorama. So we have the OmniSync paper which basically we try to build a neural network uh, by learning the depth of the two panorama and also uh, fuse the frames in between two panoramas so that it is uh, seamlessly combined. Uh, this is still like a, a, a preliminary research uh, because we were using color uh, synthetic data during the pandemic. Unfortunately, the intern could not come to Google office during the pandemic time. <laughs> and uh, this is purely done remotely. So we decided to use some synthetic data to achieve this uh, work. And in future, I hope like future research could use real data and uh, make this kind of research uh, further. So this, here are some results. Basically, the goal is like a uh, given sparse views from street view, we can synthesize the animation in between the two uh, panoramas. So in future, when you visit the uh, 360 uh, house environment or 360 uh, street views, uh, it can give you the smooth interpolation in between. Another line of work is like using NERF. So here's a work from Waymo, which uses the block NERF. And they were able to reconstruct a building uh, by taking like uh, hour long videos nearby. So uh, we also wonder, like, how can we further accelerate the real-time rendering pipeline? To that extent, um, we had a series of 4VT render, rendering research. So this line of research aims to accelerate the rendering pipeline by uh, rendering high resolution in the peripheral, in the fovea region, so which is usually where your eyes are looking at, and the rendering low resolution uh, pixels in your peripheral region where your eyes are not paying attention to. So this simple idea has huge potential, like how we can accelerate the future graphics pipeline. For example, given our original frame, uh, we took it to a log polar buffer where uh, the samples in the uh, fovea region uh, is more dense than the uh, peripheral region. And also, like uh, uh, we also applied uh, this kind of framework to deferred rendering pipeline. Uh, where the most time-consuming uh, computation is happening in lighting co computation. For example, here, uh, the roughness, and ambient, and the refraction maps uh, takes the most time to compute. However, you, by rendering them in a log polar buffer, uh, we can efficiently reduce the computational budget, for example, as a factor of uh, half or even one third. And also, although we have an additional path to restore the log, log polar buffer into the full screen resolution, we can still uh, save some uh, computational budget by having the most expensive lighting estimation in the smaller log, log polar buffer. And uh, we do some uh, user study by having people to gaze at one picture of formatted rendering and one picture of original rendering and ask them if you see you, you, if you see a match of the two pictures, and we can uh, find out the optimal uh, uh, like fovea region versus the peripheral region 
uh, by a, a slider test. Uh, and uh, yeah, feel free to dive into the paper for more details. And uh, to further uh, ask me that, uh, we also had another idea uh, in, in this line of research. So next, I would like to everyone to make a small uh, experiment. For example, uh, you can uh, hold your hands uh, straight and make a triangle uh, in front. And now ne next, you can gaze at a target, which is about like a two meters or three meters away from your eyes and try to close one eye and close the other. And then you will find uh, like only one eye has the uh, same image when you are opening your both eyes. And uh, you can close left, close right. And for myself, uh, my right eye shows the same image within the triangle uh, as if I'm opening both eyes. So this is ca called like eye dominance. And uh, so for majority of the people, like only one eye uh, is your dominant eye. And we wonder one research question, is that possible if we render the full resolution in your dominant eye and render lower resolution in your non-dominant eye so that we can further cut the rendering budget? <laughs> and the answer is yes. And uh, we also did some experiments and uh, we verify that we can further has a factor of like a 1.3 or 1.4 uh, acceleration by uh, having uh, rendering uh, only high resolution only to one eye while low resolution to the other eye. And you don't see much uh, image difference in the rendering results. And uh, along this uh, research, uh, we also had like a light fields based uh, for with rendering. And uh, also uh, we applied uh, this kind of foveation to 360 video streaming. This is also done with uh, my intern David Lee and uh, we were able to uh, stream the video uh, using a similar scheme. Uh, basically the high resolution is rendered in a grid. Uh, this is because like when streaming videos, it is better to store data uh, in a rectangle format so that it's uh, always aligned uh, with the horizontal and the vertical pixels. Uh, so we devised a new transformation called the log rectilinear. And in this way, uh, we were able to save the budget when rendering and streaming the 360 videos along the way. Uh, so in terms of compression, uh, uh, we recently had some interesting findings in uh, neural compression. We call it sandwich approach. And uh, why we call it sandwich? So the reason is that we are not changing any existing uh, compression codex. For example, right now we have the MP4, we have the JPEG. Okay, so we say we want to keep the existing uh, compression formats, but instead uh, we want to add a neural preprocessor and a neural postprocessor before and after the standard codex. For example, like given a JPEG encoder and a decoder, uh, we add our neural uh, encoder before and a neural decoder after. So in this way, we guarantee we can have a higher compression ratio than the standard image codec. <laughs> so this kind of idea uh, grants us uh, some very interesting results. We can achieve like a higher compression ratio and uh, without uh, hurting the image quality. And uh, the same idea applies for like HDR image or uh, super resolution tasks. And uh, this is majorly driven by uh, one of my co-authors, but it's a very interesting idea. And uh, so another idea uh, we had to further accelerate graphics pipeline is try to apply the levels of detail uh, concepts to 3D graphics and the neural rendering. For example, uh, the level of detail in computer graphics uh, refers to uh, you render high resolution uh, triangles uh, in your near field uh, where you pay more attention to and resolution triangles in the peripheral region where you are not pay, paying attention to. So uh, to that extent, uh, we can also have different layers in the decoder of your neural network so that uh, you can decode a lo lo like a lower resolution with uh, cost details uh, in lower levels and higher resolution with uh, more layers in uh, high levels. So this sort of uh, neural decoding process will enable the future rendering pipeline uh, a more efficient way. So for example, if the chair is close to you, you go to level four. If the chair is too far away, you just uh, give a cost shape. This is very pre preliminary research published in the ICCV uh, two years ago. At, uh, it gives you some sort, of, sort of, some sort of idea like how 
rendering could be accelerated and how a mirrored world could be reconstructed with accelerated technique. And next, I'd like to go to some interesting chapter like uh, computational interaction and uh, algorithms and systems, which highlight in depth set. So uh, uh, AR has gained mainstream popularity on mobile devices uh, with thousands of AR apps, uh, such as Pokemon Go, Snapchat, and IKEA Place. And these apps are typically supported by Google's AR Core or Apple's AR Kit, uh, where you usually de define a virtual plane when you want to place the virtual objects. Uh, however, uh, when you want to invoke such AR experiences, you still need to like uh, move your phone to scan the uh, surface. And also the, the objects in the traditional uh, augmented reality apps looks like pasted on the screen rather than in the world. Uh, for example, the ideal rendering we want is like uh, the virtual cat should be behind the bed rather than in front of the bed. So how can we achieve it? Uh, in HoloLens, we have some technique called SLAM and spatial mapping, where you still scan the uh, room and you reconstruct the triangles uh, by computing the underlying geometry of the world. However, uh, this method takes time and uh, requires some initialization. It usually requires like one to two seconds uh, to fully understand the environment around you. And it often has some uh, holes when you are reconstructing the mesh due to the uh, Arrows in the SLAM algorithm. So in our work, we wonder: uh, can we achieve a surface interaction, realistic physics, or uh, path planning uh, using depth map? So here is some uh, preview of what uh, depth map could enable you to interact with the physical uh, things. For example, collision, the ring, uh, fog effects, uh, flooding, relighting, uh, splashing. Uh, like uh, turning things into silver by touching them, uh, collision. So these kind of effects, we don't really need the reconstruction of the real world. We just need a single depth map. This is what this paper is talking about. So to do this, uh, we actually don't need any special hardware. We only need a single RGB camera. <laughs> so this kind of technique is called uh, structure from motion. Uh, basically, um, by just uh, um, start, start the app, we just give, give it a little motion uh, by using the knowledge of uh, where the IMU signal gives you, like uh, how, how your phone moves. We pick keyframes along the way. For example, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven keyframes. And then we compute the correspondence between the keyframes and also leverage the, leveraging the IMU and the post data of the phone. And in this way, uh, we can compute the disparity of the pixels. And finally, we apply a bilateral filter so that you see a full screen depth map uh, along the way. And this does not need any further 3D reconstruction. And the, uh, yeah, so here is like uh, how this is reconstructed and uh, the input RGB map, we can get a, a depth map and then you can further transform the depth map into point clouds format by computing the XYZ value from the depth map. But still, like using the depth map, there's a large gap between the traditional knowledge of researchers and the knowledge of the designers or app developers. So we wonder how can we uh, inform the third party developers and the designers to learn how we can leverage the depth map to achieve more. So to do that, we hosted three brainstorming sessions together with designers, developers, engineers. And in the end, we aggregated 39 ideas which how we can use depth map with AR apps. So, uh, and also we categorize them into three categories using three kinds of data structure. Uh, the three data structure are depth array, depth mesh, and depth texture. And basically depth array, it's simply a 2D array, uh, which is a very low resolution here, 160 by 120 pixels in AR core. And uh, depth mesh is a triangle mesh which resides on the GPU. And here uh, we uh, morph a grid-like uh, mesh by assigning the depth value to each triangle. Uh, and this approach is very similar to what we used in jewelry and uh, social street view, <laughs> as you can see here. It shares the same uh, philosophy of morphing a mesh uh, using the depth map. 
And finally, we provide a GPU-based texture for rendering purpose. And we also uh, categorize the depth, depth use case of three kind of use cases, uh, localized depth, surface depth, and dense depth. And the localized depth uses the depth array to operate on a small number of points directly on the CPU. For example, by converting between the screen space and the wall space, DepthLab provides a 3D-oriented cursor, which can orient its uh, pose uh, by, by sensing the nearby pixels in the screen. So this is done by estimating the normal from the pixels. Traditionally, the normal map is conducted by a simple cross product, uh, but we find that it's very noisy. So we further applied like a two rings of neighborhood to average the normal map. And here you can see like uh, the normal, uh, the average normal map looks more blurry, but more smoother for real-time interaction. For example, here is a laser shooting game we provided to our developers and designers so that you can shoot array in the physical world in real time. And another use case is uh, path planning. For example, uh, with a uh, localized depth lookup, uh, we can instruct a virtual avatar to uh, avoid obstacles along the way when it's instructed to walk from one point to another point. And also we can enable uh, ring and the fog effects in AR by uh, evaluating whether the ring drops uh, is hitting the surface using the localized depth. And uh, for surface depth, it basically creates a dense depth mesh. So uh, we call this use case uh, Midas Touch. When you are touching on the screen, it can create turning something into silver or gold. <laughs> and uh, the other use case is the physical collision. It's basically using the Unity uh, physical collision uh, engine underlying. And uh, but uh, instead, we create a screen space mesh, and you can easily uh, achieve this without the needs of doing SLAM or doing 3D reconstruction. You basically use a single depth map to do this. So we can also achieve the depth texture. Uh, this is called uh, texture decals in computer graphics, where you can basically uh, texture the depth mesh using some uh, balloon splash. <laughs> and uh, this uh, effect, we call it 3D photo. It basically uh, rotates uh, existing camera and uh, make a parallax effects when you are taking the photos. And using depth map, you can easily achieve this. And we provide open source code for you to do this already. And to, for these steps, uh, we also apply some anti-aliasing technique and uh, relighting technique. Uh, this is mostly done by remarching. And uh, you can drag the virtual lighting near and far. And we provide the algorithm on the GPU for developers to adopt into their uh, AR games. And uh, this is my favorite example. <laughs> like uh, it's basically testing uh, if the pixels are occluded or not. So here you can see the uh, table is light up and uh, when it goes far away, it's uh, restoring to dark again. And uh, uh, this example, we call it uh, aperture effect. Uh, and uh, the key difference is that Traditionally, when you are taking photos for people, you need to anchor your uh, cursor onto uh, the, the subject. And if you walk away, you probably need to like focus again and tap on the screen. However, uh, with the knowledge of the 3D world, uh, we can tap on the screen and focus on the flower. And no matter how close or how far you are walking around, it still knows the X, Y, Z position of the object you are anchoring with so that you can still keep the flower in focus where blurring the rest of the world. And uh, some more effects you can easily do with dense steps is like uh, occluding objects behind the physical bed and uh, apply fog effects and uh, occlude a virtual chair behind a physical table. <laughs> so we further like uh, optimize the system and uh, recommend developers the optimal parameters for the relighting and the uh, uh, aperture effects, and uh, these are not that interested, so I just skip. And uh, uh, furthermore, we develop our uh, toolkit and hand over to Snapchat, uh, Team Viewer, and also TikTok. And uh, if you use ever use TikTok filters, and you probably are using our depth lab technique here, and uh, it's also shipped uh, in Snapchat lenses 
where the snap uh, dancing hot dog uh, is empowered by depth lab and uh, the under uh, under sea world and also the uh, depth scanning and also growing trees on walls. Uh, yeah, we are proud to have the partners to use our API to achieve more. And recently, we also provided the raw point clouds, and you can tap on the physical world and to anchor arrows onto the uh, physical objects directly in Team Viewer. And uh, also Depth Lab, and uh, yeah, these are we have also have the Code Lab available online. And uh, yeah, and in future, uh, I also envision the live depths to be available on many IoT devices. Because for now, uh, we call it passive depths because the values we are getting is uh, passively sensed by estimating the depth from the motion. But right now, the phones will have uh, time of flight sensors and uh, laser sensors. And this will enable us to sense hands and uh, uh, it will enable us to sense the dynamic world uh, with a single uh, RGBD sensor in the future. <laughs> and uh, we have the code open source in GitHub and uh, also the app is available in Play Store and uh, we have the media coverage uh, from Verge, et cetera. And uh, I also want to point people like uh, some interesting demos using WebXR. And recently you can see the uh, deep learning based depth estimation online. And I also envision the machine learning based approach will be dominant in the future. <laughs> okay, so after exploring interaction with the environment, how shall we interact with everyday objects? So I would like to introduce the Idaho UI demo, which presented in Kai last year. And uh, this is a very cool demo and uh, I can explain to you what's going on here. Uh, yeah. Uh, so basically uh, I'm holding a napkin and uh, this is the instructor I'm giving to the system. Uh, I'm asking it, uh, I could, okay. Here is the live demo. So I'm asking the system, uh, show me the today's weather on the card. So now you see the weather directly on the card and you can move it far. It shows different level of detail. You tap on the card and uh, it shows different UIs directly on the card. And when you flip the card, you can register some other UI onto the card using voice. For example, saying, uh, show me the balance of the card. And uh, I'm using the Google's uh, speech to text engine to do the recognition. And uh, you can directly see the uh, like balance of the card and uh, also uh, like move it uh, in different perspective and still being tracked. <laughs> yeah, and uh, here are some other demos, for example, like uh, using the level distance to indicate the level of, levels of detail and use the six of pose to change the volume of the speaker or you can use the $1 recognizer to uh, do so the, the gesture recognition in midair. You can anchor some virtual Legos or virtual furniture directly in your, in your room and change the lighting intensity <laughs> using the everyday objects and change the color of the objects. So these demos are recorded live during the pandemic in my home. So <laughs> lots of demos are recorded in one day. And uh, lastly, I want to show you like, uh, you can also use your hand pose to uh, switch between the transla transcription or translation mode when you are listening to a talk, for example. And uh, when you are moving your hands in this way, you can show the Chinese trans translation uh, in, in real time. And uh, that will make the interaction between the the different UI and the, and the elements more natural and uh, uh, elegant in the future, I believe. <laughs> oh, all right. And uh, what's next? Uh, oops. Okay. So next, uh, I also want to uh, wonder, like, can we learn from the history to interact with everyday objects? And uh, this is in collaboration with a, a CMU professor and also an engineer from Google. Uh, we are basically uh, we make some cool demos by uh, learning the history, the famous Slurp project, which is a tangible interaction project, which has a physical uh, like color picker and there's a camera within the color picker and you can pick up the color in physical life and then 
paint in digital uh, paint board uh, to draw things within the physical color. And uh, in this example, like uh, we take the metaphor of the tangible computing scenario and make it working in HoloLens. So basically, uh, like uh, it's mostly like a design uh, rationale paper where we want to uh, highlight we can a, a lot of innovation could be done in AR space by learning the uh, learning from the history, learning from the past tangible computing scenario, and uh, make it really useful in augmented reality interaction. Uh, in terms of tangible computing, uh, last year we had an intern um, major, majorly hosted by David Kim, and uh, he he made a very a low uh, low power actually no power sensing technique we call it ritual sphere, and basically we use a pen and a very low power infrared LED uh, illuminating the spheres, and uh, there's a very cheap sensor uh, on the camera, and which is able to run all day long. So that you can enable 3D interaction in real time, like like, the, like this. Uh, let me show if there are some demos. For example, you can draw with a, a pen uh, in this way. And uh, oops, is this aligned? Yes. So for example, these are some other examples where you can have rings on fingers, and uh, it can interact. Uh, uh, it can do pinch gestures without any power. Uh, so the main motivation behind this work is that uh, we imagine like in the future, uh, the glasses would be lightweighted and uh, consume very little power. And also the sensors in your hand. For example, like uh, each time I use my Oculus at, at home, I don't use it that often. It may it all, always go out of battery, <laughs> which is really annoying. But with this kind of like passive sensing technique, uh, you can the, all the sensors and uh, interaction approaches that does not need any battery, and the sensing uh, chip on the glasses is very uh, widely available, and uh, it requires very low power. And this kind of interaction uh, would enable like uh, all day long use cases in the future. Uh, so, also with recent advances of on-device ML models. Uh, we, we further wonder, like, how can we accelerate the prototyping efforts? Uh, for example, uh, recent years we see like uh, uh, body segmentation in real time, and uh, hand tracking in real time, and depth sensing in real time. So, how can we build f multimedia applications, like as if we are building Legos? So, I honestly haven't uh, finished the slides and presentation for my latest paper. It's called RepSci. Accelerating machine learning prototyping of multimedia applications through visual programming, uh, and uh, through this work, uh, our team built a live system uh, by allowing uh, designers, researchers, and uh, ML practitioners to build a new application as if they were uh, building Legos in real time. Uh, for example, so here uh, you have the image nodes and the body segmentation nodes, and uh, we can put it through uh, graphics by drag and drop. And uh, you can easily create a virtual background application uh, without any knowledge of uh, coding. And uh, you can also do the uh, depth estimation in real time. And uh, more importantly, you can test the robustness of your models by adding noise uh, in the builder and uh, change the brightness contrast in real time. and uh, also directly generate figures for your papers in the future. So this is basically like uh, we are comparing two depth models side by side, and you can click the download button. It will give you a PDF or PNG directly for your figure <laughs> in the future. And uh, all of this, you don't need any coding. <laughs> it's a visual programming platform. And uh, here are some more demos. And uh, yeah, so, so this, uh, we can also, if you want to do some coding, you can also change the shader. For example, to, to create more blurry uh, effects for your uh, Zoom <laughs> real-time uh, video conferencing systems. And uh, but the majority of the system does not need, need any coding. For example, here you can crop the input in the system. And uh, yeah, I hope to release the platform with the team uh, around the Kai time frame, and so that. I'm also going to demonstrate a live demo in Kai this year together with the team so people can play with the system 
uh, in real time on site in Germany, Hamburg. <laughs> So yeah, we also tried the system with audio denoising models. So you can record some microphone uh, recordings and uh, do the denoising and compare to denoising model, like which one you love, you prefer. Okay, let's uh, dive deep into the final section: uh, digital human and uh, augmented communication. So this is a cool world. First of all, uh, I would like to ask uh answer the question like what is avatar and uh, uh, no avatar is not the movie <laughs> so we have the movie avatars which is very famous across the world but in computer graphics and uh, computer science uh oh this is also not avatar uh back in uh, hinduism uh it's uh, referring to descent of a detail from a heaven but in computer science avatar is a graphical representation of a user all the user's character or personnel. Uh, can you remember like uh, we, we, what is the oldest avatar in computer history? Uh, anyone on the call can give me an answer? I know it's probably kind of boring already, so just uh, to guess. Oh, there was some um, very early work done with VPL in the, in the late 1980s that had avatars. But I'm sure you probably have one somewhat older than that. But um, I, when I first did VR in the 1990s, they had very crude avatars. That yeah, case. that's a good guess and a well-made avatar. Yeah, but the avatar I'm trying to talk about here is actually Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> True, yes. It has a mouth. Yeah, it has a mouth. It can walk. <laughs> so it's actually a graphical representation of the user themselves. Uh, so what is the state of the art of avatars? So this is actually published in uh, CGRAPH 2019, where we reconstruct a uh, digital human using a, a light stage with more than 50 cameras around that person. And with this pipeline, you can uh, photorealistically render the person in any virtual environment by relighting them. And dating back to real-time digital human, uh, the most famous work I want to highlight here is the holoportation, uh, which is actually done by Sharmi Zadi and also uh, my director. Uh, back, back in the days in Microsoft Research, uh, they made the first ever real-time system to teleport a physical human to another room using the eight pairs of RGBD cameras and the person and the real-time uh, non-rigid fusion technique. And uh, with such technique, you can also uh, record your child. And the more importantly, you can uh, save the memory of what you have played with your child by uh, like replaying the memory in real time and also minimize the memory uh, as if you are observing from a bird eye view. So this kind of interaction unblocks so many potential to the future. So uh, along this line of research, uh, I have done graphics uh, jobs trying to optimize the texture fusion of the pipeline. And uh, by, learn by estimating the geodesics of the uh, geometry, and uh, I was able to do some real-time uh, fusion onto the multi-view textures so that it seamlessly uh, blend the video texture from multiple cameras. And uh, the core idea here is to not use all of the cameras, but use the cameras that is uh, like uh, view dependent to the, to the viewer. For example, like uh, in the previous rendering, you see the color are coming from every eight camera, uh, but in the, in the optimized pipeline, uh, the core idea is that you only use the side camera, front face camera, and the, the other side camera for the majority of the rendering part. So this uh, makes the rendering quality very much better. Uh, so what is the state of the art since then? So uh, previously, we have a line of geometry-based research along the way, uh, starting from Kinect Furin and the Dynamic Furin, Furin 4D, and recently, it all becoming the era of deep learning. <laughs> uh, we saw the pipeline. Uh, this is actually still traditional. Like uh, we were using uh, input images, estimating the depth map, point Poisson reconstruction, and point clouds. But after then, uh, it's getting replaced by geometry net, albedo net, and shading net using uh, mostly UNet architecture uh, in offline processing. Um, yeah, and the, using this pipeline, you can almost get a photorealistic human in real time in recent graphs. And uh, another kind of digital human is uh, pre-reconstructed and rigged avatars 
and uh, I want to highlight the uh, Rocketbox. And uh, there is open source editors, which is ready to use for all of your systems. And uh, Facebook Meta is uh, committing to uh, phone, phone scan based editors. So this will unblock you from like creating your editors with some cheap device. Uh, so the next question I was wondering is how can we build dynamic dense correspondence within the same subject and among different subjects? And uh, a CVPR paper we had uh, two years ago was trying to learn the correspondence between different editors. And uh, the idea is to uh, try to establish the mapping from one post to another post. And using this kind of technique, uh, we can do some animation from one person to another person to, for animation. And also it can help to reconstruct the 3D avatar better in real time. Uh, so how can we leverage real-time avatars as of today? And uh, so I want to highlight this work <laughs> uh, we, we did with uh, Comperlin and a major, a majorly supervised uh, student, Jen Yi, and uh, uh, we explored uh, different approaches to uh, enhance our remote communication during the pandemic time. So during the pandemic, one of the most annoying thing I have ever found is the low uh, is the bandwidth problem. Uh, oftentimes you are in your backyard or you are in your uh, at your home using home internet, and uh, you oftentimes you you, ha you have to shut down your video stream so that uh, your voice is clearly transmitted over the internet. So we wonder, can we? Uh, animate the profile photo when you are closing your video fields? And how can we uh, deliver the message who is looking at whom uh, in the remote video conference? And with that motivation, so we did a very interesting research here. Uh, and by uh, animating the avatars using a web camera based eye tracker. So here you can see, like, we learn the uh, eye movement uh, uh, like uh, beforehand. And we animate the profile photo using the uh, gate tracker uh, from the webcam. And uh, due to the time constraint, I just uh, quickly go. So there are some previous work we tried to use physical displays to achieve that, uh, but we want to like do not rely on any external hardware. So to do that, we basically uh, learn some gate images using a profile photo. Uh, estimate the depth map and create a 3D photo using the same technology of depth lab and uh, jewelry. And uh, finally, we apply the eye mask and uh, uh, move the 3D avatar and uh, only change the rendering of the eye regions. So here are some. Oh, oops. Yeah. So I have some image here. Yeah, so in this way, like you can rotate the avatar when he, they, are, they are talking, and also you can change the uh, view direction based on where we, we, which other avatar they are looking at. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, there are also some interesting finding. Like uh, of course, this is not comparable to video streaming, but we believe like it is more engaging than using traditional audio-based communication. For example, when you are uh, when your bandwidth is low or when you are using Clubhouse-like uh, communication where audio is the only medium uh, available stream. So by animating the avatar, it makes your conversation more engaging and more fun. <laughs> and um, uh, we also explored like a remote works with stylized avatars. For example, <coughs> this is also with Professor Kemperlin and uh, we bring uh, the 3D sketching to the system and uh, here are some most interesting demo where you can have your travel iterate in the VR uh, in the very early days. And the more, more importantly, we can, you can turn your sketches into 3D objects and uh, teach math concepts. For example, this is a hypercube in four dimensional. And uh, here's the demo, like you draw, uh, you draw something, it turns to 3D automatically and uh, you can change the color in real time and you can design some uh, furniture planning or your part apartment layouts with a remote participants in real time. And uh, yeah, this is most interestingly like how you can combine sketch with 3D modeling and use it collaboratively with a remote participants in real time. 
Uh, next, we wonder, like, can we further augment communication in video conferencing, AR and XR in the future? So this is one of the uh, most recent uh, work, which is uh, led by me and uh, uh, mostly done by my intern, Bruce. And uh, Bruce is still working with me on new, new projects right now. And uh, we will present the viral capturing system in Kaiser tier. I will just give you a quick uh, uh, overview. So basically, uh, when we are talking about the travel plans, uh, we are missing the viral concepts uh, together with our conversations. However, in the viral captions, uh, we developed a video conferencing system which leveraged large language model models. And we developed a 1.5K data set of uh, conversations and highlighting which viral concepts is mostly important to viralize in the conversation. For example, like Tokyo is located in the uh, region of uh, Tapna. So instead of giving you a picture of Tokyo, we give you a map of the Tokyo. And uh, we spent our weekends in Yosemite. And instead of, uh, so this, this time we give you the picture of Yosemite when you are talking with remote people. And uh, uh, the triangle building in San Francisco. So this time we give you the real picture of the triangle buildings in San Francisco in real time. So we actually uh, developed the system using large language models by learning what viral concept to uh, see, and we use search engines to uh, render the uh, pictures in real time in Google Meet directly. And uh, we deployed the system with uh, more than 26 participants. And also we did a long-term user study and we found that really uh, interesting. Like people can use the system to talk about the food they love, talk about their favorite places, talk about their favorite movies, or uh, movie stars they like. And uh, yeah, hopefully it's a system that will be uh, taken into production in the future. And uh, another sort of augmentation we, that we did with Kai is to segment out objects in video conferencing. And oftentimes uh, our video conferences is uh, we use uh, blurry virtual backgrounds. And uh, for example, if we want to show like physical prototypes with remote people, However, with virtual backgrounds, you often feel like uh, <laughs> the objects we are showing is occluded by the virtual backgrounds. <laughs> so, uh, so to highlight the objects we are showing to other people, we basically leverage machine learning, real-time machine learning technique, and segment out all the objects in real-time communication. And uh, finally, uh, like you can see the uh, virtual objects highlighted, and you can save it to some remote uh, focused view. For example, when you are showing a book, like uh, you can present your view like this so that everyone sees the content of the book in a larger screen. And uh, this is another interesting system, like how uh, machine learning can help uh, making our conversation more engaging and useful. And finally, here are some works like how AI could benefit with the accessibility in uh, physical life and the virtual reality in the future. Like we, we train a, basically we train a neural network to uh, allow the people who are deaf and hard of hearing to learn the sound events near their home so that they can be more aware of their surroundings in the future. And uh, another line of research we had is uh, how can we empower the metaverse with AI to improve our life? For example, like uh, right now the large language model is very popular and back in days, we also uh, explored like using language to uh, create uh, coloring books for kids so that uh, we can massively produce the uh, coloring books and uh, uh, help the kids to uh, release their creativity by using voice commands to colorize the uh, coloring book of, of their favorites. Uh, and today, uh, we are in a very exciting era where uh, AI-generated contents are mainstreams, not only in computer science, but also all around the world. We see DALI2, the large language model, creating uh, pictures. We see Imagen from Google, also creating photorealistic pictures from language. And recently, the ChatGPT is one of the most uh, viral <laughs> phenomenon in the world. And uh, even students are leveraging ChatGPT to make their writing faster. Uh, so uh, standing in this point, so as a researcher, what can we do to make the world a better place? Uh, I want to end this talk by playing a clip of Google.
Google I/O 2022 to envision uh, how AI can empower uh, the technology and our physical life to be a better place. For example, uh, so here uh, Sanda is giving a talk uh, illustrating uh, our initial prototype last year uh, of a translation glass, which can help uh, people in multilingual family or people uh, who do not understand uh, other language or have problems who are, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, this glass has the potential to fundamentally change people's lives. Uh, for example, so here we interviewed a family uh, in the US where the doctor speaks only English and uh, the mother who only speaks uh, Mandarin Chinese. And uh, for, for years, they cannot understand with each other but at the moment we gave the glasses to the mother and uh, it's the first time ever she sees the language which is spoken by her doctor for the first time ever. And uh, uh, she, she basically cries. Like this is how, a perfect example like how technology can fundamentally change people's lives in the future. And uh, I wish like every researcher should uh, uh, like try to devote the research, the ultimate goal is to improve people's lives. Uh, and in my opinion, I do hope we can have a metaverse in the future like this, where you can have the corporate dance experiences in an immersive environment, as well as blending the virtual reality information into the physical world, but you do not lo lost yourself in the virtual reality. Instead, you can learn history by uh, seeing the events in the past in the virtual in the mixed reality uh, you can tour around the world in the mixed reality and learn uh, culture and meet new friends and even predict the future by leveraging the large language model by using the latest technology to realize uh, the data to talk with the AI agents to help you work more efficiently and in this metaverse there will be no gap in the communication nor languages. For example, this is a Starline project in Google where you can teleport the other person in real time. And imagine you have the translation, large language model, or even uh, chat GPT uh, empowering, summarizing your conversation in real time. <laughs> and uh, as a researcher in computer graphics, computer vision, and human computer interaction, we can make a better world with these tiny inventions. And thank you everyone for listening, watching, and thinking. Any questions are welcome. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's lots of lots of work, lots of ideas. Um, uh, I'm sure we have lots of questions. Please feel free to ask or raise your hand. I will start us with um, one question, Trophy, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm amazed by the amount of ideas that you worked on and um, especially in computer graphics and how these ideas to help make make improve people's life. Um, may I ask how do you come up with these ideas? Is there like a brainstorming session or do you build on top of existing work or what is there, is there, is there something in particular that you can advise to our students and researchers to move in this direction to improve people's life? Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you. And uh, most, of, most of the question comes from a uh, real world barriers or gap I have found in my everyday work or life. Uh, for example, like the uh, viral captions is like in the pandemic, we, we for example, the gate chat, uh, we use, uh, yeah, I mean, I can share the slides with everyone later, so don't worry. And uh, uh, the gate, gate chat is a true problem when we are in the, pan in the pandemic, when I saw the uh, we have trouble like uh, streaming videos uh, for people who are especially across the country and uh, we also we only see the profile photo so I wonder like uh, can we make it animated <laughs> so the initial pitch was not only animating the uh, eyes but also animating the mouse but uh, due to the limitation we can hardly make the mouse animated in real time uh, with the technology constraint. But in, in these years, I think the mouse could also be animated with your speech. Uh, so we just uh, lower down our expectation. So why not we track the eyes and make the conversation more engaging? 
And so the entire project is done within three months or four months, very fast with uh, brilliant students. And uh, we were able to, yeah, yeah we, we all aligned with the goal and uh, it's a terrific collaboration with comparing students and uh, my students of my previous lab during the pandemic. Yeah, the other is like uh, the website projects, which I recently published on CHI 2023 this year. And uh, I have worked with many machine learning models uh, in my past years. And oftentimes I found the, uh, like the input and output very similar with each other and people are doing repetitive works. For example, like uh, engineers needs to uh, like uh, build up some pipeline to read the webcam and uh, resize the webcam and feed it into machine learning model and see the results. <laughs> and for every model, they, they have different engineers building the same thing. So I wonder what if we can uh, have Lego blocks and uh, just people just drag and drop it should be something as easy as, it, as, as this. So I talked with Tinder Flow teams with several engineers and uh, they agree on the vision. So we quickly, uh, we, we built the system uh, throughout the year and uh, with many brainstorming sessions, uh, like weekly brainstorming. And uh, the same thing goes for Depth Lab. And uh, we had many ideas are coming from like weekly brainstorming on a Google Sheets. Uh, usually the format I, I've, I've been given is like, uh, we have some, we watch some videos from Kai Waste or commercial videos and uh, everyone brainstorm their own for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And we discuss in the end of the brainstorming session and uh, everyone present their ideas. And uh, after the meeting, we summarize. So in this way, we can efficiently collect all the ideas together. And uh, we also can discuss which ideas are worth well. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, that's a really good thought because sometimes you can get caught in uh, trying to brainstorm and not doing enough work and trying to balance this. I, I especially like the RAPSAI project and it's similar to um, to Scratch platform in terms of visual yes. programming, yes. Yes, it is. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sorry that I didn't make any slides for Repsai, and uh, I'm still working on it before oh, the deadline. That's great. I would look forward to seeing it in Kai. We have a question from Chris, uh, please. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, I've just got a couple of them, actually. Um, now, I was just hoping that you can keep having your eyes so that you can show focus and distance because our eyes communicate a lot and when we're looking at something we see if it's looking beside us at us behind us how far away it is so mm -hmm. you're going to need to be really careful with your pupil positioning that yes. sort of thing and the speed at which you saccade and whatever those yeah you know, which you move from one area to another um mm -hmm. the next question next sort of thing really um now let's see uh, in your peripheral vision, you're shutting it off on one eye, effectively. Um, my mm -hmm. concern is that uh, a lot of peripheral vision is, is it's very fast and it transfers information to us, say, about a threat or something else happening in, this, in the side of, of our vision. Mm -hmm. So if you're blanking one out, I'm, I'm concerned our eyes are going to slowly get worse and worse because we're not exercising, that they're not actually performing. And particularly if you're gonna be giving that to younger children, that their eyes yes. may not develop properly and, and as full as they can, which meant, which might mean that they shouldn't be, be allowed to drive a car because they aren't seeing things happening to the side of them when they're driving down the road. So um, it's nice having the data compression and all those sorts of things, but whether you could have moving things happening in those peripheral things, just to make sure you'll keep stimulating the peripheral vision. And also with the peripheral vision, whether you can consider that um, there is a way of adjusting your color balance so that mm -hmm. um, we are, it's still quite an important part of the eye. Anyway, I'll stop talking now. Do you have any comments? Yeah, yeah, I love your idea. Like, especially for the peripheral vision scene. Uh, I talked with my advisor before, like there was one idea I had, but uh, no one is committing to that, is how about like we do a large scale study, like how people of different ages, people from different uh, like, like background try out the system. And uh, I believe we can find some uh, sort of uh, patterns that maybe younger children are, more sensitive to uh, the blurring in happening in the peripheral and uh, people who are more senior 
like uh, they have different preferences in terms of the dominant eye and non-dominant non eye. So it is a very complex question with uh, in with respect of ages and uh, uh, cultural groups. And uh, honestly, like our user study on this paper was conducted with college students, of course, <laughs> we were in the campus before. But uh, in the future, if this go is going to go to the production, there needs to be some uh, customization for people to select. For example, do you want to low foveation, medium foveation, or high foveation? And uh, if you are of a certain age group, so we may recommend you with some preset so so that it is optimized for your age group. Like uh, this, it's an open question. No one knows the if different age group have different preferences. It's a interesting part. Um, sorry, if I could just finish that. I know there's another question, yeah. but it, it's um, say if you imagine you're a small child and you're yeah. made to look at a phone all the time, then mm -hmm. your eyes aren't going to develop. Your your tracking's not going to develop. All of the visual input you're taking is through that one small hole, and all of mm -hmm. the visual adjustments are already made for you. So mm -hmm. you're not going to develop those sorts of things, and and your sound triggering as well. So you you it's coming from one point or from one reference point so that when you go to school the teacher says hello and you're going to still look straight ahead and so you'll appear to be you'll have some attention deficit problem and that's my con another concern anyway i'm going to be quiet from now thanks very much for that good talk yeah, yeah thank you chris like uh, also the frequency of eye tracking really matters like uh, uh, you need really fast uh, latency, or, or you, you need really low latency to get this stuff really working well. Yeah, I, I'll try the Quest Pro eye tracking. It's getting there, but uh, still not as high as real time communication. But uh, as a researcher, we envision like in the future, the remote eye contact should be as natural as the real world to be really useful. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Great question, Chris. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Pai. Yeah, thank you, Ruofei, for the presentation. Really exciting stuff. Um, unfortunately, I missed the first half of it as I joined late, um, but I'll be sure to check the recording later. Um, in the second half, you talked a little bit about avatars, which is actually one of my core research right now. So I just have a simple question for that. Um, based on the works that you shared, which are all really, really exciting, really great, um, do you envision the future of avatars to be more on the photorealistic side or, or perhaps uh, other kinds of direction? Because I think you shared mostly are sort of improving on the photorealistic side, right? Could you share some insights on that? Yeah, that, this is a very good question. So uh, I, I have a sl slide I'm designing, but haven't showed right now. It's like there are uh, two realms. One is like abstraction. The other is photorealism. And uh, there are also interpolation in between. And uh, you also see like two applications. One is entertainment, the other is uh, like professional uh, serious social meetings. And uh, I'm seeing some alignment between these two dimensions. For example, in professional meetings, you prefer yourself to be photorealistic. Photo you prefer yourself to be uh, your true self. But in a social gathering or games, you may prefer you to be another person, a superman, or as perceived by other people. And another interesting direction may be like, uh, your appearance may look different uh, in uh, the virtual reality. For example, like people who have like upper body impairments may want themselves to be uh, acting as a regular person. And uh, so, so this opens a whole field of research combining accessibility or avatars or user preferences in physical life. And uh, in my research of, av of avatars, we are devoting into both uh, directions. Like uh, for photorealism, we are achieving to achieve uh, photorealism with fewer input and uh, with more real-time performance with higher fidelity. And uh, on the other side, for cartoonized avatars, it's uh, like it's it's more uh, affordable on low-end devices. For example, on uh, uh, cheap devices, you can easily render a stylized avatar, but it may require more computational power to render high fidelity avatar. And oftentimes, uh, for social users, they want them themselves to become cartoonized. So that's like a two way, two ways of both work. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I do think it's very much driven by context as well. And personally, I'm looking more towards the abstract side and how we can um, tailor make to a, a person specific, um, in each individual. Thank you. Very interesting stuff. Perhaps uh, we can discuss there in, in the future if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, feel free to drop me a line and we can discuss offline. Yeah. Great question, Pai. Thank you. Tamil? Uh, that's a, thank you for present amazing presentation. I would like to ask um, the geo gallery, like how do you envision the future social communication and mixed reality headsets, like in particular way, um, you have like two to three friends uh, walking, you can see like a memory lane or the reason for not only the social media post, but how do you envision like that geo gallery or like that would encourage communication in like remote participants in a mixed reality space? Yeah, this is a very good question. So uh, one vision I'm thinking of is like uh, immersive campus, which is, will, will be really useful or immersive tourism. Because like many people in the, many child, children in the countryside, they never got a chance to really look around the world. And what if we can guide the children from developing countries or from rural areas to immersively participate in a virtual tour in let's say New York City or art museums and have a audio guide and uh, maybe you can not only use audio guide you can uh, empower the virtual agents with chat GPT <laughs> so that they can talk with you in real life that would benefit a whole community who are from developing countries or uh, children who lacking an educational resources Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. That's a great question, Tamil, thanks. Anyone else has any question? Uh, Mark? Yes, yeah, so a really nice presentation. As uh, the videos you showed, um, it seems like a lot of the work you're doing in AR is on the um, AR core on mobile yeah. phones. Are you also, uh -huh. uh, is there plans? Well, I've got two questions. One is um, the, you showed a lot of depth applications. Is there some work you're doing also about six SIG um, semantic understanding of the scenes so uh, just, uh, see, see, I'm just not just making a 3d mesh or model but also extracting objects from this yeah good question uh frankly speaking I cannot disclose any product roadmap of course yeah <laughs> and, yeah. yeah yeah and uh, that is why I can only talk about uh, things that is announced and published uh like uh, AR core and uh, uh, mobile phone. Uh, I can look if uh, Semantics API is available. Uh, yeah, there are geospatial API right now announced. I cannot discuss much, but uh, stay tuned for this year's school. I'll, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I may also get to my second question is that um, I, I wasn't sure, I was aware from some other people at Google that they were doing research with head mounted displays but it seems like most of your work is on um on phones so i wasn't sure if there was some um you know some of the toolkits you're developing or you're also doing some research with head mount displays as well yeah uh, i'd love to uh get my work available on glasses form factor and uh, it's mostly because our company do not have any available glasses so far and uh, i have some research with uh, collaborating with students like using quest uh, like right. clever VR is done using Oculus Quest, and uh, initially, like uh, for visual captions, we wanted to be in the glasses form factor, uh, but we didn't find the glasses we were able to use for one hour long and uh, longer time. So we instead visual captions to Google Meet. But uh, eventually, a lot of my work, I believe, the uh, the same story would apply to glasses form factor. It's uh, just a matter of a field of view and uh, the. Uh, degrees of freedom and uh, how you interact with other people. So I still believe the underlying story and uh, technique will apply to glasses form factor. We just don't have that great hardware. Sure. Yeah, but it seems like you're working with some partners. So for example, you have give, um, made some APIs available to Snap and they're, they're, they're of course doing some work with glasses form factor. So maybe in the future, we may see some for you working on and some of the glasses are having depth sensors and other sensors integrated into them. So it'll be interesting to yeah, see if that can be done in the future. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thank yeah, you. And, uh, 
Yeah, stay tuned. And I hope like I will do more glasses research once we have available hardware. Right. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, question from Leo. Oh, hi. Um, thanks for amazing talk. Um, it's very exciting to see all the projects. It's very, very cool. And then um, I just drop a chat um, before on the ad hoc UI. I'm very interested in contributing to the project or like using the API stuff. So it will be great if you um, and then I, I checked your website quickly and then you said um, the, there is a plan of releasing the API or something. So, yeah, it will be yeah. great. Good. Yeah, it's something. a very good question. Like, uh, uh, I, I frankly uh, speaking, like, uh, I right now, like, my core focus is like releasing uh, website visual captions, and these two open sourcing is my top priority. And uh, I frankly don't have time to open source ad hoc UI in the near future. But you can replicate the work of ad hoc UI very easily. <laughs> I'm using mostly open source open source software. Like the uh, speech to text is using Google's uh, live transcribe engine, which is open source on GitHub. And uh, the uh, image tracker, uh, I was using a customized image tracker, which our team developed. But instead, you can use the, uh, you, you can use the like AR core, like there is a, a image augmentation tracker. And uh, the only thing that is non trivial is uh, how you, uh, track an image and uh, turn it into a 3D objects. And uh, to that extent, uh, there is a uh, uh, OpenCV uh, function like uh, you can you can search the soft PMP and uh, you can turn a cord into a 3D object in real time. And uh, that gives you all the fundamental components of ad hoc UI. <laughs> yeah, but uh, frankly speaking, like uh, I'm not seeing I have time I have time to release anything before May. Like uh, yeah. <laughs> Just, uh, but also ping me if you need any uh, components. I can give you a pointer of the software you need to replicate at hoc UI. Oh, cool. Yeah. That would be great. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm very. I will be checking your uh, paper also to see. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and also, this realm is very crowded recently. Like, uh, if you check uh, Roy's web page recently, they uh, basically also rebuilt uh, at hoc UI with teachable reality. <laughs> yeah. I actually submitted my paper of ethical UI to Kai this year as well, and it was get re rejected. So that's why I'm not uh, open source. I'm not devoting to open sourcing in the near term. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, you can also check this paper. Make sure like your research does not conflict with teachable rea reality. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I. 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 Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Looking at the. Um, uh, another university apart from Max Lab and who is doing more like construction side study, like understanding the built environment, those things. And I found it pretty, it's, it's, it has very great potential to introduce such system into those like a building um, area of the research. So I'm just thinking it will be quite, quite useful. And another thing is uh, about the um, the the dictation glasses you mentioned in the late late half of the presentation, I'm also um, actually helping a group of people who are in New Zealand um, doing some uh, uh, supports for deaf using some tech small technologies, oh, awesome. and then um, apparently, and I'm just wondering. We we are also we are uh, not only interested in developing a system, but also interested in designing own. Hardware at some point, hardware device at some point to support those deaf people's uh, daily life, and I'm just wondering if they would more appreciate um, those like audit uh, audio cues information or vision based information. So I'm just wondering if it was would it be uh, good to have some sort of display um, overlaying information all the time for the people, or just giving the ear like ear earphones or something to um, sourcing the audio cues. Yeah, th this is a very interesting uh, direction. So uh, for uh, audio cues, we've seen the, uh, uh, if it's not, not reader, which one? Oh, yeah, there are both uh, glasses, which can, uh, the, the BOSE, uh, both the AR glasses, which can do the audio cues. And uh, for displays, you have the Unreal right now in the markets that you can display. Uh, live transcription and translation in real time, and uh, all the technologies are there. And uh, the first ever translation glasses paper is uh, uh, 
variable subtitles. And uh, yeah, if you do this line of research, check out the variable subtitles and uh, you may see some interesting uh, findings like how people use a glass uh, for eight hours a day. <laughs> and uh, it may, yeah, you, you can see how uh, like uh, social accept acceptability and uh, how people can use the uh, classes for all day long. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for the information. Yeah. Um. It would be it would be great if we could have a, a research discussion later on at some point. Yeah. As it yeah. will be awesome. Thanks very much yeah. for your presentation. Yeah. No problem. Feel free to drop me a message. I feel like every year summer. Great questions for you. Thank you. Uh, Last question from Gan. Sorry, we are running a little bit over time, but yes, uh, fine. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, I, my question is not really about uh, the presentation itself, but I, I noticed you mentioning a lot about intense students. I wonder if you can share a little bit more information about um, if there is any students from our lab um, interested in doing an internship or um, working with you. Um, kind of roughly outline what kind of opportunities are there and how how often or long can you take internships? Yeah, uh, usually like uh, uh, there are two kinds of uh, internship uh, we are doing. One is like a formal uh, internship and uh, which is usually in summer. And we are only accepting like final year PhD student for that, that kind of research internship. And uh, I have very limited headcount for that. Like uh, usually like only one per year for uh, final year PhD. And the other program is called Student Researcher. And uh, we used to have many positions of that. Uh, let me search for, uh, yeah. So if you search student researcher program on Google and uh, you also need to find a researcher you are willing to work with and drop them an email, talk with them. And uh, there should be student researcher PhD or master both. And uh, that is usually opening all year round and uh, uh, but that usually student researcher program is designed particularly for that student. So it needs to both students and the uh, researcher to align on one proposal very well before application. <laughs> so just drop the researcher you are interested in before that. And uh, I usually like uh, prepare such proposals every uh, September to December, you already Q4. And uh, by this time of year, honestly, like uh, I have already de determined like a summer interns and uh, student researcher for this year. But the planning for the next year is usually like uh, September to December. Thank you. And yeah, yeah, the other way to collaborate is like uh, casually collaborating uh, over uh, remote meetings. And uh, I have such academic collaboration as well. Like, uh, although you are not formally affiliated with Google, uh, but you can, you, if you are willing to work with me, I can participate in risk, like a one weekly meeting and uh, supervise you, supervise students like uh, writing papers or conducting projects. And that is like a very informal. And uh, I do sometimes take informal students to internship if I could, <laughs> but uh, it really matters about available headcounts and uh, whether you have passed the interview or not. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much for sharing those information. Amazing work. And thank you, everyone, for the questions and being here. Uh, thank you, Rofi, for sharing your slides and ideas with us. Uh, we learned a lot, and we look forward to opportunities to collaborate in the future. Yeah, thank you, thank everyone. You. Same here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.